So hi everyone, I am Vazia Zamindar, an uh, prof associate professor in the history department here at Brown. And I'd like, you, I'd like to welcome you all to this book, Adda, for how secular is art, politics of art, history, and religion in South Asia. And I'd like to thank the Saxena Center, in particular for the Forum of the Adda, and the Kogut Institute, for the long durée of supporting this as a project which has resulted in this book. The Adda, as I understand it, is a form that both celebrates a book, but, and I'll say a little bit more about the celebration part because that's quite important, uh, a, a form that celebrates a book, but it also is meant to facilitate an urgent conversation on the stakes of the work we do, of our inquiries, of our scholarship, for a world we must share. Whether we bear witness to the burnt rubble in Janawala in Punjab, or stand with the fiery poetry of Shaheen Bagh in Delhi, there is a sighting a sighting of crisis in its multiple senses of being visual, locational, and authorizing. And that this sense of crisis, as if this decisive moment is both here and now, and not here and not now, is not just that of politics, but of the political concepts that had once organized post-colonial aspirations for overcoming the colonial regimes of religious difference. The colonial regimes of religious difference. And it has forced in South Asia a long and ever urgent set of deliberations on the term secular. Those of you who work on South Asia, the word secular is like familiar secondhand. Whether conceived as a rights-bearing constitutional term, an ordering of time, a mode of critique, a set of practices, or simply sense perception. For in these extended and episodic deliberations, there has been, and I've said this in an earlier forum, a world making at stake in how and by what means we can live together with a plurality of beliefs. This very world making at stake. How can we live together with a plurality of beliefs that deserves emphasis? Art history has been drawn into the fray, kicking and screaming, not only through the ancient monuments and rubble and the politics of retributory violence, but also through an abundance of forms that have demanded entry or challenges disciplinary formations. And the attacks on and the new activism of contemporary art have made it an integral interlocutor. If political scientists, historians, philosophers, literary scholars have all had something to say about the secular <clears throat> as an orientation or a displacement of religion in the face of religious nationalisms, so do those who have had to contemplate the very objects, visual and material, of the hugely contested domain of history. Tapati Guha Thakurta has been a major interlocutor over three decades at the intersection of art, politics, and history, based at the esteemed Center for Studies in Social Sciences in Kolkata, India, and deeply embedded in the cultural and intellectual life of the city. It was our windfall when she was invited by the Kogut Institute for Humanities in the fall of 2018, just when we had inaugurated a series, Art History from the South, and Kogut then catalyzed with Tapati's presence to organize a symposium, How Secular is Art? A question that set in motion a whole series of other questions fiercely animating that symposium, and of course, which has led to the uh, given life to the long durée of this pro book project. I'm gonna let Tapati take us through those questions. The book has seen some terrible losses. The book has seen some terrible losses through the pandemic and its aftermath. Most recently, Kavita Singh, one of the contributors of the book, who, with whom we had an event in May as she battled cancer and who passed away this summer. 
this is why a celebration, a celebration of the book is important. A great many losses of which this was one. A celebration is important to bring us together yet again and think of the journey of such projects engage and its long life. Through the trial of the project, it was sustained over the years, so many emails, COVID years and thereafter, by deeply felt commitment that while secular critique, that while secular critique may not have been able to offer us the robust opposition to the brute violence of religious sentiments and exclusionary nationalisms, ethno-nationalisms, we cannot dispense with it lightly either. Centering art as a secular field to think from, we must ask, how do we restitute the dreaming mind? How do we restitute image imagination for the unlearning of partitions, for repairing multi-religious cohabitations, and a diversity in faith? Or are these demands on the secular and on art too heavy to bear? It is an extraordinary privilege to have Tapati back from Kolkata here at Brown and for this event and for the students she has been meeting since her arrival yesterday. Uh, she has been a mentor and a friend to me and to many generations of students and scholars of South Asian visual worlds. And so uh, I'd like to uh, welcome her back and uh, invite her to take us deeper into the book. But before I, uh, she comes up, um, I want to also quickly introduce all the four uh, interlocutors for the book uh, so that after she presents, we can move steadily on to them in the order I am uh, introducing them. Sudipta Kaviraj probably needs no introduction, having been at Booker Does and, and at various uh, events at uh, Brown over the years, a professor of political thought at Columbia um, and South Asian political thought in particular, who has written extensively on concepts that have a deep bearing on this book's project of concepts like secularism, of course, but religious pluralism and tolerance, another word that appears again and again in the oeuvre of South, Asia, of South Asian writing, part of a larger collaborative thinking, a thinking from the global south. It directly has a bearing and intersects with our concerns here. Uh, Kadri Jain, who's come in from Canada, professor of visual studies, of, uh, of Indian visual studies uh, at University of Toronto, a contributor to the book, uh, has written uh, extensively on popular religious and political images and icons that challenge the domain of art history, aesthetics, but also engage deeply with political theory. Naeem Mohammed is going to join us uh, over Zoom. He is uh, promised to be here, but uh, uh, unable to do so. A contemporary artist, filmmaker, and writer uh, based at Columbia, his recent anthology, Midnight's Third Child, proposes a kind of creative rethinking of Bangladesh's past and one from that uh, location, uh, forcing all of us into a different set of conversations. Holly Schaefer is our very own, a professor in uh, history of art and a contributor to the book, who brings a kind of sensitivity and deep reading to images that potentially shift our understanding of the political. And that is evident in both her, uh, her recent monograph, Grafton Arts, and her uh, work within this book and other writings. So we'll be hearing from her as well. And so uh, without further ado, let me welcome Tapati. Uh, thank you for being back and being amongst us here at Brown. Uh, I can't tell you how special it feels to be uh, be back in Brown uh, and have this first physical gathering and what we now see an 
in person, these words have particular importance now because for so long, and even continuing now, we've been confined to the words, to words of online interaction. So it's special to be back for a physical gathering and a face-to-face -face discussion on the book, which in every sense originated here, and then of course traveled across time and space. Uh, as Vazira said, um, it was an honor for me to be here in Brown in the fall session of 2018. Uh, we never knew each other, Vazira and I. Uh, we had learned from each other's works. Her book on partition was extremely important in courses we taught. Um, and then we taught the course, which was very broadly called Art History from the South. And one of the kind of um, mandates of the work I had to do here was to organize a conference. And it's something we began thinking about as we were preparing the course. And the, I must say the name just suddenly came. It was a provocative title to have an how there. Um, and with the how, of course, a series of other writers like when was the secular, uh, um, in what terms the secular arrives, so all of those were questions. I'd like to begin, though, a bit by thinking uh, in more concrete terms about where my, and in some sense, my own disciplinary engagements uh, came into almost a direct uh, engagement with the question, but I would more use the term, the crisis of the secular. Now, we know in South Asia, it's been common now over several decades to think about the secular as a deeply contested and troubled terrain, but also one that seems to be forfeiting a lot of ground. So my own interests in it came out of incidents in the early 1990s uh, when I was working on my book, uh, which later came to be titled Monuments, Objects, Histories, but where the last two essays turned out to be the first ones I really wrote, which was addressing two crises, two political crises, one which affected a historical monument and another which affected a contemporary Indian artist. Uh, I'm talking about the Babri Masjid, and I'm talking about M.F. Hussain. Um, what interested me was the ways in which the crisis of the secular translated into a crisis within the disciplines of archaeology and art history. So archaeology's failure to save a 16th century mosque through an entire debate on evidentiary remains um, and stratigraphic histories on either proving or disproving the remains of a 10th century temple, uh, showed up archaeology battling with its back to the wall, and the failure of the larger institution of the Archaeological Survey of India to save a historical monument. And there was, of course, a big debate on why the Babri Masjid remained a disputed structure rather than a classified historical monument. So it was the one time when one openly confronted the history versus myth, good versus false archaeology debate, but it really became a crisis of disciplinary knowledge and its location within a larger public domain. The same came true with M.F. Hussain, who inhabited, in fact, commanded commanded the world of modern Indian art and the imagination of modern Indian art in a way perhaps no other single artist had done. And it was, again, a very strong art historical defense that was mobilized to talk about the long history of nudity in India's religious iconography. And yet, at the end, uh, it could not save the artist from going into exile, nor bringing him back. I mentioned these two very cathartic, almost cataclysmic events of the 
1992 and 1996, because it showed up in some ways the troubled grounds of the secular that the disciplines inhabited, and that categories which we assume to be safely and securely secular, like the monument, the historical monument, the discipline of art history, and the field of contemporary art practice. Things which we assumed occupied a secure ground, immune, a degree of immunity, and I use the term immunity to a series of political and other animosities, uh, really th those edifices were really literally crumbling as in the case of the Babri Masjid. So these were critical moments when the crisis of the secular very powerfully reverberated across the disciplinary, the academic, and the artistic worlds that I and my cohort of colleagues, students, academics inhabited. So it is really from there that a larger thinking began to emerge about looking more critically at the place and locus of the secular. How far is it a safe and secure habitus for the worlds of academia, art, history, and a series of historical objects and structures in museums and in public places. So I'd like to here just pitch it again at two levels with which some of the ideas emerged, which is that if we look at the field of art practice, and let me just say that there were many, many questions that we could have raised here um, to think about many other fields of art, uh, and that is perhaps, we, the book could have gone in many directions, as could the conference. So we could have taken the entire field of South Asian art history, different schools, periods, objects, and raised this question in different contexts. But it became, in some sense, an address to a more contemporary <coughs> period. That's broadly the temporal frame we look at where on one hand, we were looking at the almost assumed secularity of worlds of contemporary, modern and contemporary art. And, and as against that was the discipline of Indian art history, which only in its far more recent disciplinary turns have engaged with the modern and contemporary in very direct ways. Uh, at a time when I was wanting to work on art, colonialism, and nationalism, the field of the modern and contemporary was only coming into the disciplines of art history proper. The discipline of art history was largely concerned with the great schools, the great ages, many regional variants, but where the religious was, a, again, a taken for granted factor. Much of the objects of architecture, sculpture, and painting that were the subjects of the discipline of art history came from often uh, distinctly regional and religious traditions. So the religious was a category that the field of Indian art history actively engaged with. It marked its difference often from Western art history by its central engagement with objects that were religious in their orientation. And one of the ways in which I be, I've been trying to understand is what is the place then of the religious within a modern discipline, which is differentiating itself from religious studies, even as it is engaging often with religious ritual texts, trying to repurpose them as new subjects of aesthetic, artistic, art historical analysis. So here was a, maybe a simplified binary between a almost given and assumed place of the secular in worlds of modern art. So when modern artists painted religious themes, as they very often did, and I could think here of a very long history from artists of the Bengal and Chantiniketan school 
to K.G. Subramaniam, Gogi Saroj Pal, several others. Religious iconography is not something modern and contemporary art ever did away with. In fact, it claimed iconography on several terms, often on subversive, on experimental terms, and it is really the battle to reclaim iconography as a larger cultural inheritance, which was Hussein's great battle. He always said, the 5,000 years of Indian culture is my own, right? So that, his location within that. So this was, but nonetheless, uh, painting a religious subject did not make that work of art a religious object at all. And that is the misplaced attention when one said a work of art offended religious sensibilities. The big question, the epistemic question to ask was, that is that the purpose, is that the public, is that the address at all? So that, at the other hand, it was also very clear that the once ritual, the once religious objects, once they came into the ambit of art historical analysis, museum collections, art history, books, never really forfeited the religious. So the religious remains not just an underlayer, but often an active, element of tension, a layering, which could be recovered. And that was, these were the kind of questions I began to grapple with in my study with museums to ask uh, how easily do ritual objects get fully and completely reinvented as works of art. And there's scholars like Richard Davis and all who've always talked about her transactability, where objects move in and out of different connotations, depending on use, public, address, and there were no complete transformation of one to the other. I also looked at the spiritual as a designation that somewhere mediates the religious and the devotional with a space of the secular. We know that the spiritual becomes a very powerful category of Indian Orientalist and nationalist thought. So very broadly, these were some of the questions, if I could say, from within the discipline of art history and art practice, which made us wish to engage with the secular. The secular as often a tired, contested, overwrought term. We, the book placed itself clearly in the aftermath of a large body of writing and debate on the secular. We had the advantage of having that with us and behind us, and I'm very grateful to graduate students who helped us compile a wonderful reading of the very rich body of writing. It, it, we are not locating it in what very often is called a post-secular. We wish to think about the secular still as a ground uh, of recovery, reclaim, and reinvention, most importantly. So, that is the way in which we wish to hear, think about how we may bring the secular back, not in opposition to the religious, not in opposition to the communal, uh, which of course is there, not as political dogma, not as constitutional mandate, or each of these are extremely important, but to think of it as perhaps opening up self-questioning within the fields and disciplines we inhabit and are trying to work with, but also, and this is something that Wazira referred to, to think of whether it can also open up a new grounds of solidarity and shared spaces. And if something emerged over the five years in which we worked on the book, it was the deep sense of solidarity and shared commitment across scholars fighting different personal and professional odds. To think of the secular as a ground. Here, Shaheen Bagh, which wasn't there when our conference was there, but the stakes moved very quickly. And I'm thinking about the extraordinary winter of protest with which our book begins, which is the Anti-Citizenship Act debates in South Asia, and the sites of protest it was a very buoyant time when the NRC, the National Register of Citizens, and the Citizenship Amendment Act opened up 
a space of protest and resistance, which has been quite unprecedented, actually, in terms of its move from campuses to community spaces. And then the Northeastern Delhi riots happened, and COVID happened, and many things came to a sudden end. So in a way, if some of the crises of the 90s forms the backdrop to this book, I think over the years that this, five years that this book evolved, 2019 and the protests that began became very important in anchoring our book within a sense of optimism and hope, a shared solidarity across space and time with all of us struggling with these. I think I've taken up my time. So what I will do is, uh, OK, this is our book. Um, we wanted to have several copies made available here, but our publishers were not particularly helpful with it. So I like to say. The book is available as an e-book, and I'm told it costs much more to buy in America, so it's easier to be bought in Delhi. It can be sent across. Um, very briefly, to give, take you through, because that was my brief, the different sections in the book. Now, the book divides, perhaps in somewhat arbitrary terms, into four broad sections. Um, Secularity and its art is where some of the main theoretical outlines of secular, but secularity is laid out. And I like to very broadly think of political theorists, art history, contemporary art history, in which Karen Jijewitz specializes. She has a book called The Art and the Secular in Modern India and more broadly a field of popular visual culture, visual <coughs> studies, the place of religion that Kajri Jain wonderfully brings into the conversation, very powerfully interrogates. So we are here thinking about the secular as being addressed and engaged with from the field of the broad political cultural to the specific field of contemporary art practice, which Karen feels remains a very sure and powerful guarantee, God and guarantee of the secular, to thinking about what religion does when it, is, when it begins to inhabit art history. Also, Kadri makes a very powerful proposition about speaking from South Asia, not just speaking on South Asia, but speaking from South Asia with it. Part two is really about thinking about boundaries and partitions. And here I need to say that this book is not representatively South Asia. Uh, we cannot make that claim. Uh, it is very heavily, very, very far too heavily than we would have wanted, focused on the Indian subcontinent. But the two essays by Vazira and Sangjukta, but more broadly, I think it is to think about partition as an essential part of the story of secular modernity and its fracturing and its contestation across the divides of India, Pakistan, East Pakistan, and Bangladesh. This is a conversation that needs to be taken far further. It is only gesture that. The part three is called Art and Its Gods. And you know, we, I owe many of these catchy titles to Vazira. Uh, we think of iconography in this section. And I will use the term iconography in its broadest sense, from the political, the religious, the devotional. Uh, and I think all three essays, they deal with the worlds of iconography. And to think about both the sacred and the devotional worlds that art and religious objects often inhabit, different orders of sacrality. And the final section is looking at, again, the category of the historical monument and the resacralized monument in different ways. Uh, how do we bring enchantment back into a discourse of disciplinary knowledge? Uh, how do we make the monument, an object of awe, wonder, and deep sense of belonging. 
And equally, we are looking at the replanted temple. The Hindu replanted Hindu temple, a landscape of thickly proliferating uh, revitalized Hindu temples as against another landscape of demolished and threatened Islamic monuments. So we, I end the introduction, Fazir and I divided different bits, thinking about a new threat to mosques in Varanasi, in Mathura, the Gyanbapi Mosque, the Shahi Ikta Mosque, where neither legal nor archaeological protection is available against pressures that wish to now open the mosque to search out it, the Hindu idols within it. So we are back to this, a continuous landscape of re revitalized Hinduism, a newly political Hinduism vis-a-vis -vis another very, very fraught and fragile landscape of Islamic monuments. I'll end there and I'll let the other speakers take on. Sudipta is next, but I, Tapati was speaking. I want to especially do a call out to Faraz, Heather, and Anav Adhikari uh, for the work they did on this book. Thank you so much. You don't have uh, any pictures, so the pictures will just go off, I think. So thanks uh, for the invitation to participate in this um, very interesting conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. <coughs> I <coughs> read, the <coughs> read the book with uh, deep interest. And um, I thought that I'll make some general remarks about some theoretical questions which are involved in the book. And I thought that if I got the time, I would like to make a couple of very short remarks on uh, your paper, Vajira, and uh, Tapati's. But uh, I don't think I'll get time to do that. <coughs> so let me, because what delighted me about the book is that um, it's a book which is in a particular discipline, but like all good books which are in a particular discipline, it also wants to ask, which is not a very easy stance to take, <coughs> some fundamental questions about the nature of the discipline itself. Uh, that's what I really liked about the book, and practically every single essay in the book raises uh, questions of that kind. So I decided that I would also respond to that provocation of the book, essentially by going into some questions of theory. The other day, <coughs> in Colombia, we had a very nice uh, event, which was uh, celebrating the work of Partho Chatterjee. And I was one of the speakers. <coughs> and just before I spoke, <coughs> somebody made a remark about, a slightly critical remark about the discipline of political theory. So I said that you know I wanted to celebrate Partho as a political theorist, so I must first make uh, a remark in defense of my discipline, political theory. And I said that you know I must confess that I, I always found reading political theory fascinating. So when I was very young, 
and I was studying in college. <coughs> I read Hobbes's uh, Leviathan, the first part, and I read the argument which led up to the statement, life, life became solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. I thought simultaneously of two things, or rather two ideas came simultaneously to my mind. One was, you know, how interesting this argument was, how tight and how powerful. But it was accompanied by the question, why am I reading this? And I personally feel that, you know, what this book does is to bring that question, you know, why am I reading this in my, when I was uh, very young, <clears throat> I think it actually tries to reformulate that question, give it a more sharpness and body, and bring that into the discussion of art history, which I really appreciate. <coughs> um, so the first question, I think the book uh, asked me to think, is about disciplinarity if you put it in uh, conventional language. And I think the problem with disciplinarity is that when I'm told as a young person that I'm being trained in a discipline, I'm told that I have not yet actually learned to think. So I must learn how to think about that uh, discipline before I actually go into the act of thinking properly. The problem about that is that in this period, when I'm being trained, Ideas are being put into my mind, right? But when I become a fully-fledged academic, I'm asked by the, by the discipline itself to think about every particular proposition critically, to start with the uh, basic question, is this right or wrong? Should I be dissatisfied with this or should I be uh, content? But when I'm being trained, it's very interesting that, you know, that is not how ideas are actually being funneled into my mind. I'm given ideas, but I'm not being told that, you know, these are ideas about which you should have, <coughs> you should have a kind of critical orientation. So because of that, I think what happens quite often is that some of the ideas which get into our mind while we are in the training, you know, we are much less critical. Actually, I would go further and say that the Discipline is actually inviting us to be much less critical about those ideas than the ideas that I would encounter after my training is finished. So what is, I found interesting, I'll put it very sharply in order to generate a discussion. <coughs> Several papers in the uh, collection, challenges and struggles with the idea, which is very common in some uh, types of writing, because I'm also interested in art theory from a different kind of angle, that uh, art is secular, right? So my first question is, not just to people who are writing this book, I'm grateful to these people because they're questioning this, but I think this is something that we should ask the discipline generally. Why should we take that to be even a kind of preliminary definition of art? Uh, <coughs> because it's quite clear that the proposition that art is by definition secular is a very powerful idea. It resonates, but it resonates in our time because it is our time. And it is an idea which is taken for granted or it's very powerful in a particular part of the world in a particular time. So it, is chron it has a chronotopic determination that it's a particular time and it's a particular place. Where this idea actually becomes a dominant idea to such an extent that it actually forces other competing ideas about the definition of art out. Now, you know, as somebody who is interested in theory, I immediately face a problem with this, that if I'm doing history, you know, what is history? History, by definition, is dealing with different periods of time whose contents are bound to be different. You know, that is what history does, ancient, medieval, modern, or whatever. You know, whenever you differentiate, let's say, one or two, even two periods in history, it logically, it immediately means that you assume that the content of the two periods would be different. And you immediately face a problem with this kind of a definition. If I draw a definition of the subject itself 
from one of, the, suppose we have only two periods, you know, A and B, but the definition of my subject is taken from period B, right? Then how do I do justice to period A? Because the moment I go into the period A, I would not encounter art. I would encounter something which is definitionally non-art, right? And this is linked to the question of religion, you know, what to do with religion and secular. I'll give you an example of something which is happening in sociology with which I have a similar problem. You know, a lot of people now, essentially in search of precision, conceptual precision, are saying that we should define the term religion very narrowly. And in Germany particularly, the, some researchers who do wonderful work otherwise, you know, who are using a term like religionization. That is, you have certain ideas which can be called theology, soteriology, etc., etc., but it's only at a particular time in the West in the development of Christianity, you have something which can be fully called religion. I think it produces exactly a similar problem, that if you do that, then uh, what happens in Vedic India is not religion. What happens in Buddhism is not religion, right? I don't think this is actually a very good way of approaching any discipline, and particularly, these, are, these two are not identical arguments. It's not a way to <coughs> approach any discipline, particularly a discipline which has the term history in its title. It is not a good idea, not a good approach to the problem of a historical discipline. And I think what I liked about this <coughs> book is that many of these essays actually go into this question and slightly indirectly bring in this question of disciplinarity, that is making something a discipline actually, you know, sort of habituates us with certain types of definitions which are actually really placed beyond any critical doubt or any critical inquiry. So this is something that we should do, not really in art history. I think we have to do it in political science, political theory, everywhere. For instance, my question that, you know, why I'm reading Hobbes, while I was mesmerized by Hobbes' argument, I also have to ask the question that I'm reading it in a small town called Nabutip in provincial West Bengal. I speak in Bangla, and this is my world. Why am I devoting so much of time you know, reading this admittedly powerful philosophical derivation about the nature of political of the political world. This is also linked to the question of reading from elsewhere, which is also raised, I think, very powerfully in Kajri Jain's paper. I then <coughs> want to take up the question of the secular. Now <coughs> it's impossible to uh, summarize and bring together all the different lines of inquiry that you get in this book about the difficulty and at the same time indispensability of making a distinction between religion and the secular. One thing which is not tried out, I think some Hindu, some Indian philosophies, Hindu and Buddhist, ancient Indian philosophies, they sometimes try something which I think we could probably discuss, that every single distinction, you know, every single distinction has a logical context. That is, there's some kind of logical problem which people, philosophers, encounter. And in order to get around that problem, resolve that problem, go through that problem, they propose a distinction. There's a tendency in <coughs> social thinking, philosophical thinking, you know, for that distinction to have a kind of afterlife which simply goes beyond that context. And when it goes beyond that context, I think the, the distinction starts either failing or distinctions actually starts producing consequences, which are perverse consequences. So I think one of the things to do in using the distinction between the religious and the secular, right, is to say that we need the distinction between the religious and the secular, but to make conventional protocols, you know, this is what the philosophers would call conventional definitions or protocols, and say that for this particular argument, or for this particular subdiscipline, this is how we want to use the distinction between the religious and the and uh, the secular, but also show that even in within those confines, sometimes it's very difficult to hold to those uh, concepts completely in a stable way. Now, <coughs> but I wanted to make just one 
criticism <coughs> about something which I find at play in some of the papers, uh, in some papers more uh, frontally, in some papers not frontally, they're not cent it's not central, but it, uh, I can see it's uh, working there, which is the distinction between soft and hard uh, Hinduism, not Hindutva, but soft and hard Hinduism. I am very opposed to this, and I'll tell you why. Think of what would happen if we use the distinction of soft and hard on Islam. So it presupposes on the one side <coughs> that all Muslims are the same, right? or all Hindus are the same in some major respect. The distinction is only the distinction between soft and uh, hard and soft. So the whole Islamic community in the world would be made a single community, which is read, led by Osama bin Laden. And in the flank, at the very end, you will find people who have Muslim names, who have nothing to do with that kind of ideology, but who simply have Muslim names. And in a certain sense in their life, enact a certain kind of Muslim culture. So I'm very opposed to that. I personally, I don't think we actually get any benefit from the uh, soft and hard Hinduism distinction. Soft and hard Hindutva raises a slightly different kind of question. But here there are papers which deal with uh, this distinction, which is also quite common in Indian political sociology sometimes. And I would say that you know this is misleading because the distinction between Savarkar and Gandhi is not that Savarkar is hard and Gandhi is soft. Gandhi is not soft on religion. Gandhi is very hard. If you want to characterize Gandhi, Gandhi is a very hard Hindu. There's no other way you can characterize Gandhi. So I think the point is to, let me make another point which I usually use in teaching. We have to face this problem of, you know, what is the sense in which Hinduism or Islam or Marxism these are a single body of thought. I personally feel that you know these are a single body of thought. I'm not doing it jestingly. I think you know you will see that the logical properties are the same. <coughs> that um, you know these are single, not in the sense in which doctrines are single or theories are single. You know these are single in the sense in which old structuralists would say that there is a single structure. The structure is a, is a repertoire. The structure is not actually the use of the repertoire. You know. So you cannot say, what is the meaning of the English language? But you can ask a question about what is the meaning of every sentence that is written in the English language, right? So language is a repertoire, right? The language is a combinatory. And you cannot ask a question about the combinatory. You cannot ask of a combinatory question that is entirely justified in asking about, uh, yeah, asking about the uh, about the theory, and so I personally think that you know it would be, uh, religious thinking is like an alphabet, and different thinkers use different parts of the alphabet to produce different kinds of doctrines. So I think it is much more useful for us to focus on the nature of the combination that they produce, which I think can be characterized much better by saying that Savarkar's Hinduism is exclusionary, and Gandhi's Hinduism is inclusive, right? Rather than see it in terms of hard and soft Hinduism. So I think that is something which ought to be abandoned. The last point, very quickly, <coughs> um, modern and pre-modern, modern or traditional. Um, I was talking to Holly Schaffer just now, and I was telling her that you know, the question that came to my mind there was that we must ask the question, what is a past? What, when we characterize something as past, what does it mean? It clearly means two different things. You know, past can mean something. I'll give you an example from two words that we use in, in Bengali. You know, in Bengali, if we say past is otit, that is atita in Sanskrit, the general sense is that it is something which is not actable anymore. You know, it originated in, in, the, in, the, in the past time, and you cannot actually act on that in the present. So this meaning of the past actually draws a rupture 
draws a clear red line of rupture between the past and the present. But a whole lot of things about which we uh, use the designation past, you know, they are past elements of the past which are still present in the present and which are still, you know, active in the present. If we take uh, Taputi's paper, for instance, on the Durga Puja, I would not, you know, think of how odd it would be to say that Durga Puja is a festival from the past. Of course, it's a festival from the past in the sense that you know, it's not something that has been invented over the last five years. It is from the past, but it is very strongly present in the present and it is being modified by the present, and it allows itself to be modified in the present in a certain sense. So we must make a distinction between the two different ways in which the past can be mobilized. And if we do this, then I think we would actually get away from some of the unnecessary problems, I think, uh, I find in some of the papers about, let's say, Nalini Malani's uh, art, and particularly Gita Kapoor, who is a close friend of mine, <laughs> the criticism of Gita's interpretation of Nalini Malani. I think I personally would say that, you know, uh, a different criticism of Gita and Gita's kind of position, which I also held for a very long time, is much more legitimate, you know, which is against the avant-gardist nature of uh, secular art, that the avant-garde actually becomes so advanced that the following army loses sight of them completely. And so you could have something like that. I'll make one last point very quickly. <coughs> I think both in Vazira's paper and um, Topati, there's a very interesting question of the fame of artists or I would say fame, not the popularity of artists, um, which again are of two kinds. You know, one is a kind of fame where I would say that you know Heidegger is a great philosopher. I don't read them, uh, I don't read him, read his books. I can't understand his books, but I concede that he is a great philosopher. Right. So this is fame based on deference of a particular kind, not on popularity. There's another kind of fame which is based on popularity. And the distinction between my saying that I respect Heidegger, but I do not read him, which is fine, a lot of respect and like that, and uh, my respect for somebody whom I like, I, I live his art, I, I enjoy his poetry, etc. My, the question of intelligibility is very different between the first case and the second case. And what I find interesting is that, you know, in, in your case, Vazira, the Example is fascinating because he is somebody who is a famous artist, and later on, you know, when his art is um, challenged and questioned, uh, it's very, very interesting. I could actually talk for an hour about that. Uh, why he goes into silence? You know, what is the meaning of his silence in the later part, uh, later part of his life, when he simply does Islamic uh, Quranic calligraphy and nothing else? And in Topati's paper, what I found very interesting was not merely the ability of some of the artists to constantly comment on something which is contemporary, particularly that astounding Durga Puja, where Durga is actually portrayed as a, as a migrant mother who is looking for shelter with her, with her children. It's quite extraordinary. But the interesting thing is that uh, it shows that in this kind of case, we can probably breach the distinction between the two types of fame that I was thinking of. That it's the, and I suspect, going back to the question about Gita, which is also implicit in what you, your remarks here today, what kind of art can actually resist the power that we are facing, which you must remember is popular power. It has a lot of popular support behind it. So I suspect it's not the art in the exhibition but the art on the street, you know, which has this kind of popular art, which can uh, provide a true opposition. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, so many thanks to Vazira and Tapati for inviting me to be part of this adda around this very important volume. 
and uh, to the Saxena Center at Brown's Watson Institute for their gracious hospitality, particularly um, Grace Cardono and Bronte Dinges, who so patiently and good humoredly managed the lo logistics. Um, as for many of us, at least some of us, this is an emotional occasion for me, given that the volume and the conference that led to it are indelibly marked by the presence of our brilliant, beautiful, sorry, <laughs> irrepressible, irreplaceable Kavita Singh, who is the jan or life force of our field, who left us at the peak of her powers. She was a treasured interlocutor, and I'll miss her dearly. Though, of course, um, her work will continue to inspire us and give us life. Not just her beautiful writing, but also the, the recorded talks that convey not just the quality of her prodigious mind um, and her marvelous eye, but also her warm, vivacious presence. But one lesson that I've learned from her passing is to cherish all the more those who are still with us. Um, not least Tapati and Vazira and the others in this volume. I feel hugely privileged to be in conversation with you. Um, Tapati, the, <laughs> this conversation has been going for decades. Um, I'm, you know, you've been a mentor to me for, you know, ever since examining actually my PhD thesis. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, so let me just start by congratulating, thanking, and really celebrating uh, the Tapati and Vazira, uh, first for organizing the conference, and then after that as editors, putting so much reflection um, into the book um, after the, um, in, the, in the wake of the onslaughts on citizenship in the form of the CAA and NRC, followed by the protests at Jamia and Shaheen Bagh, which uh, so poignantly bookends the introduction, as well as, of course, the devastation of the pandemic. And as part of this reconsideration, the subtitle changed from that of the conference, which was On the Art of Art History in South Asia, to what you see here, on the politics of art, history, and religion in South Asia. So it opened up the conversation beyond strictly disciplinary concerns to make art an entry point into a wider set of explicitly political crises. I mean, and maybe you can, uh, I'm assuming that was the intention, but maybe you can talk more about this. So particularly interesting and rewarding for me was the way you also invited these additional chapters to open up a more considered attention to art and secularism in the constitutionally religious states adjoining India. I mean, we, as you said, you, you couldn't cover the whole thing, but I, we don't have chapters on Sri Lanka and Nepal, actually, where Hindutva from India seems to be making inroads. Um, but I learned a lot from Vazira's lovely essay on the Pakistani artist Sadiqen, that's uh, the fame that Shudipto was just talking about, um, and Sanjukta Sundarasan's on Zainul Abedin and Bangladesh. Between them, they remind us to look at crises in secularism over a longer durée, from the lead up to the first partition and through the second, not just starting in the 1980s or 90s, as some of the India-centric accounts tend to, but also, this is really interesting, in an image field where religion is not, as Sundarasan says, quote, the main organizing principle of post-partition, post-colonial identity, the secular emerges as what she calls, quote, a non-slash-para-slash-alter religious sensibility, concept, and practice. So explicitly thinking secularism beyond constitutional guarantees and across a set of variegated relations to a religiosity that's taken as given in the political infrastructure 
seems to me a productive and particularly apposite uh, way of thinking with images in at least a couple of ways. For one, it illuminates how secularism can be seen, as Sundarasan puts it, as, quote, a question of a dialectical becoming and not radical departures, which I also take to mean emergent, a matter of futurity, an ongoing project, not a done deal from which we're now straying. And this is a very useful corrective for those of us who are nostalgic for a lost Nehruvian moment, myself included. And indeed, several essays in the book point, if not explicitly to a dialectic, to a variegated spectrum within both religiosity and secularity. Many are situated at sites of uh, boundary work, as STS calls it, between secular and religious frames, where the challenges to this distinction serve to illuminate, reconstitute, reinscribe, or dissolve it. And I'm thinking here of Tapati's uh, essay on the astoundingly creative uh, Durga Puja Pandals of Calcutta as neither fully secular, nor art, nor religious. Um, Hollies on the Maratha king Shivaji as both mortal and god. Uh, Kavitas on the reactivation of a temple for worship in the name of conservation, hitherto <sighs> considered a secular pursuit. Or Sumati Ramaswamy's on her own secular practice as a historian, being constantly confronted by mother goddesses. Or my uh, description of quote, pilgrimage come tourist complexes featuring religious mega statues. But my point there was also to say that secularism wasn't particularly achieved in the West either, even as secularization became a powerful myth around which modernity was organized and with it the idea of art as a secular space. So this goes to that you know, period A, period, you know, imposing a concept from period A onto period B. Meanwhile, those essays that deal with individual artists, like Wazira's, Sanjukta's, or Karen Zitsuwitz's on Rumana Hussein, demonstrate how art can be a space for performing and imagining secularity. Again, whether or not it's protected by secular freedoms backed by the state. And here, I also wondered about Zara Jumaboy's Cri de Coeur against Gita Kapoor's championing of the Baroda group's secular use of devotional icons, idioms, which, if I've understood it correctly, as accuses them of not delivering the promised secularity that Kapoor sees in her work, in their work, and of working with the tainted materials of a Hinduism that some may not be able to distinguish from those of Hindutva. So I, I mean, of course, I sympathize with her frustration, but I'm wary of such a clearly causal activist interpretation of the work of artists and critics. What artists do, whoever they are, trained or untrained, high or low, feeds into formations of sensibility that are simultaneously ethical and aesthetic and qua sensible are the basis for politics, but there's no predictable causality here, for the temporality of these formations is also emergent, stochastic, nonlinear. We don't know what will surface when or how, but that work of the sensible has to continue and be able to continue in order to man imagine the world otherwise. The second productive aspect, I think, of thinking the religion secularism dyad beyond a strict opposition is that this allows other forces in the image field to surface that also come into assemblage with both religion and secularism in less obvious ways. Again, in uh, Vazira's and Sangjukta's essays and Zera's by negation, this includes not just the related pressures of state patronage, figuring the nation, and a sense of public responsibility, 
but also often articulating with these the leftist commitments that have strongly subtended subcontinental politics in varying degrees of coexistence with religiosity. And it's funny, I'm kind of repeating that religion, secularism, Marxism uh, triangulation. So this triangulation of art, religiosity, and left politics bears attention globally in that, as I keep insisting, we need to be radically rethinking art history from the global south, not just adding it to art history as usual. But coming back to India, perhaps, for instance, and maybe Tapati, you might want to comment on this, this tri triangulation shed light, sheds light on how, in your deeply reflective essay, after 2019, the Durga Puja becomes a space not just of incredible formal experimentation, which it always was, but also of renewed political cr critique and concern for labor and the precariat. Uh, like the, the immigrant mother. Um, even as this is subject to censure by the Hindutva Brigade and to political capture by the reigning anti-Hindutva TMC, if we think processually, surely the prior decades of left government in Bengal shaped people's sensibilities, which now surface under, the, under TMC and corporate patronage. After all, the same people who voted for the CPIM are also flocking to the Durga Puja Pandals, right? Um, so even if the left distanced itself from the festival, as you say, perhaps it also unwittingly enabled the emergence of this often irreverent and yet intensely devotional form, including by fostering the conditions in which mixed teams from various religious communities work together on these installations. So this again goes to that kind of a layering of the present onto a past which has not gone away. It kind of insists in very material form, in, in the form of practices um, on the present. Now, this is not to romanticize the left. We're all <laughs> well aware of the critiques, uh, caste and gender-based critiques here for a start. But also, more broadly in terms of method, it is to think about the other sensible infrastructures that come into assemblage in this field of art, religion, and secularism. And among other things, this also means looking seriously at the ethico-aesthetic work of those who don't call themselves artists, but nonetheless have a huge impact on public spaces as sensible environments. And here it's no coincidence that the sites of boundary work between the religious and the secular in the volume tend to be public spaces rather than those explicitly demarcated as temple or museum, right? So I'm thinking here, for instance, of politicians, bureaucrats, and engineers as aesthetic actors working primarily via the aesthetics of development, often in conjunction with architects and uh, museum consultants. Through such actors working across scales and registers, religion as cultural politics is leaching into secular spaces like public monuments or parks, as well as museums and universities. The redevelopment of the Central Vista in New Delhi is just one example of it. This, with its lotuses and you know these kind of snarling lions uh, that make over the Buddhist Ashokan uh, lion. Uh, another is the register of environmentalism that privileges, for instance, Vedic flora, and conversely, something like the participation of contemporary artists in the show celebrating the Prime Minister's radio broad broadcast, Man Ki Baat. So that's another instance of a capture of secular space that isn't overtly religious, but can also only be described as para-secular. So we can really no longer take for granted what uh, Tapati, I think, calls the naturalized ontological secularity of contemporary art worlds. For what has been naturalized can also be denaturalized 
in a highly controlled ecology of the type that's being nurtured by the Modi regime. So really, this volume, particularly in the light of these additional essays, only strengthens my conviction that we need to be thinking about the politics of the image field more capaciously, while also defending and heeding Akil Bilgrami's reminder of its limited reach, and this goes to Gita Kapoor's avant-gardism as well. Um, so defending and extending the space of creative rights and freedoms that we've come to call art. So um, thank you, um, Fazil and Topaki for inviting me. And I uh, apologize to everyone for not being there in person. I was supposed to be back in New York, but uh, events intruded. And so as a result, here I am in Bangladesh um, at 3 in the morning here. So uh, I'll just get right into it. And I hope the sound will be clear here. And if there are any technical hiccups, The sound is great. Know. And thank you for being up at this hour. Uh, so in my remarks, I take up one chapter from this book, uh, Sanjukta Sundarasan's Modern Art and East Pakistan, Drawing from the Limits, a partial reading of the life of Zainul Abedin, given the honorific Shilpa Charjo, or Dean of Arts, a reading that spans the period of United Pakistan and the first decade of Bangladesh. I take up Sundarasan's notion of the location of as being an agent of the historical. Here, the location in question is first the geography of East Pakistan within two wing Pakistan, and then after the 1971 liberation war, the independent state of Bangladesh. Prior to 1947, East Pakistan was, of course, East Bengal within United Bengal in colonial and pre-colonial India. However, that is not included in this chapter's time span. Sundarasan looks at the pedagogical and studio career of Zainul Abedin and how it spans and changes as it navigates a 27-year history as the national artist of East Pakistan within the United Pakistan project and a brief six years in the same role in independent Bangladesh before his death. Hers is an argument for what she calls the limits of the post-colonial Pakistan state on its remote eastern border. Epistem. Sundarasan begins her chapter with a reproduction of this stamp produced in Bangladesh in 1986, 10 years after Abedin's passing. It is called Leveling the Plowed Field or Moidawa, one of Abedin's trademark brush stroke representations of village life. I want to introduce you next to another stamp as a way to reflect how the temporary nation state of East Pakistan giving way to the independent state of Bangladesh created a set of problems for a teleology of Bangladesh as coming into being as a secular Bengali nation state. Here is another stamp representation of the same geography when it was not yet Bangladesh, but rather East Pakistan, situated within the poster for an excellent seminar organized a few years back at the University of Edinburgh by my colleagues, film historian Lotte Hook and ethnographer of the Bangladesh-India border, Delwar Hossein. 
Hook and Hussein's title, possibly borrowing from the Sergio Leone Spaghetti Western film, Once Upon a Time in the West, and substituting East Pakistan for West, have called it a forgotten state. And this gets to the crux of how we see the East Pakistan period and geography. United Pakistan existed from 1947 to 1971. And the Bangladesh Independence War of 1971 was both predicted in metaphorical political speeches, but also a wholly unexpected event culmination. Born out of a nine month war, Bangladesh has spent the last five decades codifying its brutal birth. One step uh, here has been to backward invent a teleology whereby East Pakistan never properly belonged to a Muslim nation state. Instead, all events from 1947 to 1971 have been pulled into a narrative of inevitable Bengali linguistic nationalism, and all evidence of an attempt to belong to an Islamic identity have been subsumed. Yet at the same time, a recent turn toward a scholarship of the United Pakistan project has also pulled in the opposite direction, pulling East Pakistan back into an Islamic narrative. Note here that even the American architects Dunham and Bowie, who designed East Pakistan's Komlapur railway station, shown in this stamp, are described as neo-Islamic. Even though three of Bowie's six mega projects in East Pakistan in the 1960s were affiliated with the Catholic Church, including St. Joseph, my alma mater. Zainul Abidin too has been pulled into this Islamic reinscribing. Akbar Nagvi, in his 1998 book, has placed his work within the Pakistan identity, while Iftikhar Dadi, in his 2010 book, argues for the container of Muslim South Asia. Note also that Dadi's placement of Abidin within modernism is sometimes at odds with the description in Sundarasan's chapter, which reminds us that Abidin faced criticism in East Pakistan for staying firmly within a realist representational school while the dominant trend of that time was moving toward abstract non-representation. In an essay on Zainul Abidin's iconic paintings of the 1943 Bengal famine, Shovon Shom describes a pre-47 Calcutta art establishment that responds with hostility to what Shovon Shom said, some called social realist Muslim art. This identitarian silo is transformed by the rupture of 1947, when Zainul Abedin migrates to Dhaka from Calcutta, along with several Muslim colleagues. After moving to East Pakistan, Sundarasan describes an altered reality, where Abedin becomes a nationally feted artist, patronized by a state that wants to graft an Islamic narrative onto forms of art already practiced in East Pakistan. However, Besides a poster exhibition that presents a chronological history of Muslim presence in India, there are no examples, at least in this chapter, of instrumentalized religious elements in his art projects. Some of the limits of religion within art practices is represented instead, not in Zainul Abedin, but in quotes from his contemporary Murtaza Basir, who is often cited in this chapter as expressing resentment at the pressure to include Islamic elements within his paintings. Abidin's visual language, which Sundarasan calls folk realism, is rooted in a desire to represent the rural everyday, a contrast with the more urban life-focused artwork she perceives as coming from West Pakistan. His subjects remain peasants, labor, and domestic subjects. We do not find either evidence of an Islamic pedagogy nor an active resistance to it either. There are hints that a focus on the rural is also about marking differences between East and West Pakistan, but the secular project within that is not immediately legible. If anything, the critical response to his work by the 1960s, including to this painting of what Zainul Labedin called in the archaic term of the time, tribal girls, starts becoming disenchanted by his insistence on staying within a realist ruralism. Novelist Soyod Waliullah, in a 1955 review titled Victim of Conflicting Ideas, calls Abedin not modern enough, journalistic drawings, and perhaps most devastatingly, more suited to an ethnologist equipped with a camera. 
Abedin's 1970 drawings from a Palestinian refugee camp are explored in a different essay by Sundarasan, a contribution to a volume I recently co-edited with Esther Zakax titled Solidarity Must Be Defended. In that volume, we present Sundarasan's project as part of an example of transnational solidarity tied to a moment of non-alignment. As editors, we did not conceptualize Sundarasan's research as an instance of Abidin's return to an Islamic grand narrative. And certainly in 1970, that was not the primary framing of the Palestinian movement, although it certainly became more markedly the case after the 1974 Organization of Islamic Cooperation Summit in Pakistan. What I mean to say finally here is that reading the presence or absence of religious themes, presence or absence of secular art history, icons, and events within the work of Zoynul Abedin and other artists of the Pakistan period is always framed by the positionality of the reader and the time of the reading. For most of my adult life, we in Bangladesh have been presented with a Shilpa Charjo Zoynul Abedin who is a representation of Bengali artistic resistance to Pakistani rule. His folk realism focused on the peasant every day has been presented as part of a secular resistance to the Pakistan project, leading inevitably to independent Bangladesh. Sundaran's chapter presents a more complex, contradictory, realistic lived art. His artistic output, role as an art educator, and his interactions with the Pakistan state and its institutions is marked always by dualities, what she calls consolidation and critique. It is appropriate to end, as Sundarasan's chapter does, with this 1970 Zoynul Abedin painting of peasant political leader Maulana Bhashani, enveloped by a representation of victims of the 1970 cyclone, <laughs> returning Zoynul Abedin in some ways to the themes of his 1943 famine series. The Pakistan state's paralyzed response to that cyclone's catastrophe led to national fury that channeled into the overwhelming victory of the Bengali Nationalist Party in the election that same year. This then led to the political deadlock with the Pakistan army and eventually the Bangladesh Liberation War. The unsteady post-war reality in the aftermath of that war is one context for the figuring and reinscribing of an absence presence of secular resistance or religious themes within the work of Zoynul Abedin. Sundarasan calls this painting a twinning of Bhashani's Islamic socialism and Abedin's socio-aesthetic pedagogy. She considers it a secular form of the art of rupture. The twinning of Abedin and Bhashani in this work also point to the contradictions within the secular retelling of Bangladeshi art history. Bhashani remained always a contradictory figure throughout the British Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladesh period. British Bengali scholar Laili Uddin's forthcoming book on Bhashani will be an authoritative account of this unique life, which I look forward to reading. Meanwhile, I see Bhashani as a figure who embraced socialism within a peasant popular, as well as embodying the figure of the Maulana, the revered pious religious leader. Yet at key moments of our history, he took counterintuitive moves that placed him outside his own potentiality as a national leader. Perhaps no move more momentous than his decision to boycott the 1970 Pan-Pakistan election in protest against the government's mishandling of the cyclone response of 1970. This decision meant that when the 1971 war broke out, there was no official elected left political party within the maneuvering for both the guerrilla army and the future nation state. What that decision meant for future left possibilities of Bangladesh, we see in the contemporary of the last 50 years. Abidin's twinning with Bhashani in this work and in the book chapter hints at futures that did not come to pass within Bangladesh history and East Pakistan and Bangladesh's conjoined art history. Thank you. Thank you.
It is with great thanks and congratulations to uh, Tapati and Bazira, um, <clears throat> to this book, and to the Saxena Center uh, um, that I begin this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. And to the other commentators, that's what I want to say. Thank you so much. I'm really, truly honored to be among <clears throat> this group. I wanted to begin with a generative question that is posed in the introduction to how secular is art. Uh, and I quote, along with the notion of the secular, can the very objects of art and art history also be reimagined from the locus of South Asia from its colonial and post-colonial vantage points, um, end quote. And that's from uh, Vizira Tapati and Kadri. Of the three parts of this question that the book puts pressure on, the secular, art, and art history. I'll focus my comments mostly on the last, on art history today, and specifically the section in the book, um, Art and Its Gods. Particularly through the notion of trespassing. Tapati Guhathakurta opens her wonderful essay on the festival that celebrates, and I quote, the animal homecoming of goddess Durga in Calcutta. Uh, and um, I'll put one of those images on the screen. Um, in the book with how the festival dismantles, in her terms, disciplinary boundaries, allowing, and I quote, artistic, religious, and secular practices to freely trespass into each other's domains. And here we see just one of so many Durgas along with her entourage designed by an artist group, the Environmental Art Collective, that shows the goddess in a leafy abode surrounded by pots raised from the rich clay of Bengal that can be recycled back into that earth. In Sumati Ramaswamy's essay that follows, she meditates on being, and I quote, a historian among the goddesses of modern India, end quote, and in her process of becoming, in her words, goddess aware, of throwing off the straits of the historian, and this is her language, who typically maintains a discreet distance from these sites of affective intensity, end quote. In her case, as she explores in her essay, her dissertation on Tamil linguistic nationalism underwent a metamorphosis in order, um, again in her language, to capture the array of passionate attachments between the deified, feminized, and embodied language in the form of Tamil Thai, who you see on the screen, a site of wondrous intensity and its, enthr and its enthralled speakers, end quote. What if, Sumati asks us, following the political theorist Jane Bennett, we agree that to be enchanted is to, si to, is to be simultaneously transfixed in wonder and transported by sense, to be both caught up and carried away, end quote. And uh, she puts forward, what if we allow ourselves to be so caught up? The new analytic of Tamil devotion that emerged for her in uh, Tamil Paru, as she puts it, allowed her, and again, this is her language, to show that attachment to Tamil and Tamil Thai cannot be easily contained within the time-worn binary of secular versus religious. For one, bled into the other, as she writes, making boundaries blurry and contours confusing. And we're seeing this again, the, 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 the dissolution of the boundary. Tapati also, and again in her language, renegotiates a place for affect and devotion within the academic field of art history and for art and aesthetics within the visual worlds of modern religion through Durga Puja, a mega urban spectacle, and here I'm just putting another one of her wonderful examples on screen, that continuously defies the normative institutional registers of both religion and art in her language, um, in part because it and again, a quote, tests the sanctity of worship within her festival, courts the contemporary art world, and engages with the political, as well as resists political appropriation. And in this example, uh, and of course we can also ask her <laughs> herself, um, Robin Roy, and I'm again drawing on her language, produced a dramatic installation of a dimly lit fortress leading into a detention camp titled Borod, or Barricade, consisting of three concentric, cir con concentric circles. Um, the outer one made stunning use, uh, again, Tapati's language, of an old craft of puppet making with date palm leaves to make rows of tiny marionette shadow puppets in cubicles. 
And you can see that in the top um, a slide, the top part of the slide. The other two circles presented a play of hand shadows and lighted boxes, iron figure silhouettes and wooden bamboo designs of police helmets and shields. As one entered the final inner, final inner circle, there were video clips running on the upper walls of police holding back barricaded protesters, while at the climactic center was an unusual figure of a Durga on a horse lion embellished with iron plate ornaments. Again, all Tapati's language. Another display was even more explicit. Here, Subrata Banerjee, in an installation titled Address, they quote, spoke of this very lack of a secure address for the millions of those the state was rendering homeless, end quote. Um, specifically through the NRC, or National Registry of Citizens, um, and using that shuttlecock, which you're seeing on the top, as a metaphor for the stateless persons being lobbed from one country to another, um, in the midst of which were hands and heads, the hands protecting uh, children um, uh, poking out. Durga, in her telling, I quote, seeks an alternative artistic connoisseurship and forges special effective bonds with her community of patrons, makers, and viewers, end quote, and therefore also asks that of us as viewers. This is a type of forum in which Durga both enables the artistry and the displays and is witness to them and um, so, so kind of generously and capaciously allows uh, for a, a, a way to speak and comment on, on the present. In my um, essay in the volume, uh, and here I just want to also reiterate what others have said, that how a conversation emerges in the essays and a conversational tone that is so, uh, thanks to Vizira and Tapati's engagement and, and putting pressure on those in the volume to push themselves. I also was struck by the inability to contain the potent portrait of the re revered Maratha king, Sri Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, in the framework of the religious and the secular. In fact, it's the only certainty that I was able to conclude in the end by investigating the history of the portrait, which drew on portraits done in a Mughal manner, seen on the right, um, a temple icon of the king paid for by fishermen uh, that you see at the center, and circulating imagery of Hindu warrior gods like Khandoba, who you see on the left. Um, and this is in the late 19th century, but obviously so very much a part of contemporary uh, politics in India. Yet in conversations with Vizira, I also began uh, to meditate on my own practice of art historical writing which in this instance I found even more than usual to hew to the positivist and distant. Indeed, the scholars from the era in which this portrait uh, was made, particularly this one by Raja Ravi Varma uh, in the late 19th century, were steeped in this method, um, initiated by the German Leopold von Ranke and put forward in Maharashtra by V.K. Rajwade in the founding of the Bharat Itihas Centradak Mandal, a space for the collection and study of Indian history, which uh, drew specifically on the region um, of Western India. Perhaps an homage to that anti-colonial use of that method, but also to offer as balanced and, uh, and dispassionate an analysis as possible to see the many aspects of Shivaji's portrait in order to diffuse its potential as an instigator of religious unrest, that I, I found myself pulling, pulling back um, and being almost so rigorously, if not traditionally, <laughs> art historical. And um, as I reread the essay, I saw that uh, even more sharply, which was so fascinating. Um, in reading through the volume in its entirety, and here I'll just put up another image from Sumati's essay on the very new goddess um, uh, of Corona Mata. Uh, and here you're seeing the coronavirus at the bottom that um, Bharat Mata is attacking. The push and pull between the traditional skills of the historical disciplines, the pull of the objects and the yearning on the part of the authors to invest something um, more than just historical um, emerged as a thread among them. The authors seemed to want to incorporate something more than their discipline allowed, in part to contend with the power in the objects and the potent political forces pushing against them or seeking to appropriate them. 
be it enchantment, fear, fascination, sadness. And all of this kind of threads through the writing um, in the book. And this lends the essays their own particular power because so many are written in the first person, which I think is also striking, um, and incorporate personal reflection alongside historical and art historical research, literature, anthropology, religious studies, criticism, et cetera. And I know this is something I have learned um, from, from Tapati in particular, who I just want to draw here. Um, they, are, they are all writerly, incredibly writerly, and also very much of the present, to go back to what Sujipta um, Kaviraj uh, spoke of, even as they investigate the present or the past and how the present engages with the past, the past, pressing on how objects move from one category to another in Kavita Singh's um, beautiful language, um, and um, how... Uh, many of the art historians aim um, to bear witness to, to this imagery, if not actively intercede um, in, in the present. So I'll just end um, with Vizira's wonderful question of how do we restitute the dreaming mind? Um, and this is such a provocative question, I, won, I think one that the book um, puts forward and has inspired really all of the authors to contend with. So thank you. Um, and let's just take questions from the audience uh, because uh, we have a limited uh, time um, and it'd be good to get as many questions um, on the table and then have everyone respond. We're going to need microphones for the Zoom participants. As people warm up to questions, did you have your hand up? No. Well, I, I, I'm going to ask, uh, yeah, um, I'll ask Tapati, maybe you have some responses or reflections on some of the queries that were put forward. Thank you, Naeem, for staying with us in the middle of the night. Now early morning. Early morning, yeah. Um, I think I've already had my share of, can I be heard? Yeah. So I wouldn't like really to take up more time except to now reflect on what has been said beyond the book. I think Naeem's intervention on a single essay very closely to think about what he calls a lost history and geography of a nation that existed for only a very small period has been very important because it's brought, in a way, the question of partition, uh, boundaries, the, the very fractured boundaries of always uh, policing that boundary between the religious and the secular has also translated into then the policing of boundaries between these newly created nation states. So thank you, Naim, for bringing <coughs> Bangladesh, particularly East Pakistan, which is the time uh, the most difficult of entities perhaps to contend with now. Uh, back into this conversation in a very direct way. Maybe I'll just open it up by thinking since there was this triad of, um, I think, religion, secularism, and Marxism put there. Um, I'd like to hear say that one of the problems have often been, and I think this is an ongoing strain, is to say, is there a way in which we can bring devotion, affect, a sense of belonging, a sense of deep engagement into the very secular objects of the fields in which we work with? I think enchantment is a theme that Sumati particularly worked with. Shanti Kaburi Bar has a tirade against disenchantment and what it has done often. But I'd like to say that perhaps the secular, 
which has always been seen as dogma and political mandate or a culturally uh, empowering space for inhabitation, has also been a form of faith and belief. And I think perhaps the more endangered it has been, the more it has been equally a place for a reactivation of faith and belief in a different solidarity. And somewhere, I think, from that moment where many congregated, so-called in defense of the secular, to a very different moment that we inhabit now uh, in this present thing, has been also to think about what is what are new grounds of community forming, of active dissent and resistance, and of different solidarities that can be forged. I think this question became very important. It was important at the time of the conference. It became particularly urgent in the years that followed. And I'll end here again by thinking about what writing this book offered us as scholars um, working across uh, not just times and space zones, but across different national boundaries. So I do believe that I needed to be in Brown to be able to work with the Pakistani scholar on the terms on which Wazira and I did. And the book has been not by intention but it became a book about women scholars in the field. I mean, when we look back at it, it was not something we consciously designed that way. Uh, most disciplines can remain male-dominated. Uh, this was a way in which several, and I was perhaps the senior most scholar here, younger people in the field came together. And I feel, therefore, to think about solidarity to think about new collectivities, academic, professional, creative, and personal, have been a great takeaway from this book, even as we realize the secular is an ever slippery ground, ever changing ground to inhabit. So I'll keep it at that, and I'll open it up to any questions. I'd love to hear more I, from Shudip Tada about his response to my essay. Uh, I'm, sh as does, I'm sure, uh, Vazira, but we look forward to that at another time. Are there any questions here? Or comments? Or comments, yeah, or, or comments. Or <laughs> um, if I may uh, say something by way of maybe op returning back the questions that um, have been raised by Sudipto and uh, by everyone else as well in different ways. And that is something, uh, Dapati, you spoke of the words, the term spiritual, and how significant it is, spiritual, to a whole series of formations uh, that we, in some respect, still want to or need to grapple with vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, nationalism, but also in terms of formations of communities, uh, including <coughs> those of solidarity. The spiritual remains something that, um, along with secular, is both slippery but necessary in its, in its slipperiness to be able to be <coughs> mobilized in different sorts of ways. And here I was thinking about the sort of nature of spiritual and secular in this sort of the, the 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 lack of sort of boundedness except when in opposition to or when set against where then its contours become somewhat clearer um, and this is one of the tensions with what was raised as the soft versus hard Hinduism particularly coming from Zara's essay, but so that you suggested that it permeates all the essays, this tension between soft and hard. And I'd like to push against this because um, this it's a way in which uh, speaking of this kind of amorphous terrain of the spiritual 
And um, it is when it is um, uh, set against uh, the secular or set against Hindutva, the hard, it is this, the soft and the hard are kind of like boundaries, the fuzziness, moments when they're fuzzy and, and then when they're hard, that I think particularly Zera is trying to grapple at, that there is a kind of porousness between the soft and the hard that we must speak of or think with if we think with the slipperiness of the spiritual and the secular simultaneously. I don't know what you think of that. I wonder if this permeate the ways in which you talk about the soft and the heart permeating all the essays might be further elaborated on. Do you want me to? Uh, yes, respond, and then maybe others, Kadri, how you think about you know this category of the spiritual as it's moving through the essays, mediating secular religion. Well, um, can you hear me? Um, let me take your question first. Um, let me uh, mention something which uh, I feel very happy about, uh, which is that there is a kind of, you know, even if you thought about the fields in which I either work or I'm interested in, like politics, uh, sociology, political sociology and uh, literature, art, etc. What I find striking is that through a lot of very serious research, and I think your book is a very good example of that, that you know, people who take something very seriously, who take their own training seriously, when you go into it and start pushing, you know, then you realize that you can, the material that you are trying to grapple with, it has a kind of Kantian effect in the sense that you know you realize that the difficulty not merely comes from the object, the difficulty also comes from the way you are trained, mm -hmm. you know the way you see the object. So the problem is not just the difficulty of the object. The problem is also partly at least lodged in your way of seeing the object. And I'm delighted that you know there is a lot of questioning in this field, particularly religion secular. I'll give you two three examples. <coughs> I personally feel, um, reading Tagore, uh, I think we use our thinkers thinking rather submissively. We don't see very important innovations there. But I find, for instance, you know, in, uh, in I teach courses on the concept of the secular. And one of the central things there is, for instance, in, in German thought, uh, the problem is that if you accept science's view of the world, right, then what do you do to religious ideas? You know, for instance, if, if you take uh, Bultmann, uh, the question is that if you take the scientific picture of the world, what do you think of something like resurrection? Because without believing in resurrection, you cannot say that you are a Christian. It's a very powerful uh, argument. What I find in Tagore, it's a very interesting line, which says that I do not see why, if you take the picture of modern science, your belief in God, uh, a kind of deist conception of God, right, that should become weakened. So his argument would be that you know you can respond to the universe in two different ways. Science shows us more and more how complex the universe is. And there is no contradiction in saying that I see the universe as very complex. But the greater the complexity, the more I respond aesthetically you know, to the harmony of this kind of complexity. So the basic argument there is that we should not take for granted the Weberian argument that with the development of science, you, know, you necessarily go into something like disenchantment. So there is an argument of this kind. I feel very energized, you know, by this kind of thing, to think more about it. I do not have any uh, simple uh, response. I also felt, for instance, the question of spirituality that you raised, I think is a very important, very important question. Uh, 
Gita's work, for instance, touches on that, that spirituality is not something which is necessarily uh, religious in the uh, narrow sense. I wrote a paper recently called uh, Can, um, Can a Nastika, like me, uh, appreciate Astika poetry? You know, that is Tagore's poetry, which is also se centered on the question of secularism, uh, sorry, spirituality in a certain sense. So I think what is interesting is that, you know, the connections that we took for granted and as sacrosanct, I think those connections have become questioned. I'm not necessarily saying that they are being taken apart. And the problem is that if you take a structure of concepts apart, you also have the responsibility of, of substituting it by something which works. So I do not quite see that, but I see this as important. One thing that struck me, just one sentence on what Taputi said, there's not a criticism of what he said, but because I'm uh, a student of politics, uh, I found something very interesting. You said about East Pakistan that uh, something that existed for such a short time. You know, and I thought that I would ask the question this way, you know, a description of something that existed for such a short time. Because in a certain sense, what we are dealing with, you know, are is very powerful descriptions of people as nation states with the boundaries and things like that. So I think it's full of all kinds of interesting questions. I don't think I have any clear answer to that. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody else wants to jump in? Please raise your hand. Katri, do you want to respond or think or raise other questions or name? If you want to jump in. There's a question here. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, my question was actually There is a mic that was yeah. meant to be handed around. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thanks, Name, for uh, staying up uh, <laughs> and tolerating this question in the middle of the night. Um, uh, I'm thinking, uh, what actually, uh, this question particularly for you, but I think anyone in the panel can also jump in, because uh, it's also concerned with this triage that has come up uh, uh, of uh, Marxism, uh, religion, and secularism, and um, can uh, can we think of Zainul Abidin's work also in that earlier register of realism that came up in the 1940s with uh, Ipta, and uh, you know the work of Chitta Prashad and others, who uh, and uh, you know if, if, even though the organization is called the Indian People's Theatre Association. Uh, a lot of the Marxists were also very, very worried that religion was entering into the sort of art practices which came out at that time. <laughs> so this sense of, you know, this uh, transnational exchange that we need to once again uh, rethink. Uh, in, in the case of Bengal, say, maybe in the case, uh, not in the sense of a somewhat romanticized un United Bengal, but the actual, once again, to go back to Shudhita Kaviraj's uh, proposition, the actual historical underpinnings of uh, the Ipta movement. And, and it's continuing legacy um, well into Bangladesh. Thank you for the question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll say a few things that are slightly related, but not a direct answer. Uh, you know, I think it was said that it's a short period, but actually 25 years is not that short either when there's a massive inflow of um, uh, funds to try to build a new nation state, including educational institutions, which is what Zainul Abedin um, I didn't really talk about it in my remarks, but that after a certain point, his main identity became as the founder of the National Arts. It's just to give an example of how the rewriting of history erases East Pakistan, the way it's always been presented in Bangladesh is as the founder of the National Arts School as if it started in 1971, even though it started in the 1960s, and back then it was the Pakistan Art School. So just the impossibility of allowing the existence of East Pakistan within our national narratives is what we've grown up with, and that's why things like Sanjukta Lotte Hook's work on East Pakistani cinema, um, exchanges between West and East Pakistan is one of the things we've been looking at. Um, you know, you mentioned it. Uh, one of the things I'm struck by, it's not in Sanjukta's essay, is that, you know, so Anil Abedin was very thoroughly for a period part of the Kolkata scene. And then he seems to have left and gone to Pakistan relatively easily as well. 
Um, Sanjukta makes a reference to, you know, fleeing or being in the face of anti-Muslim riots, but there's no evidence that I've found that Zainul was personally affected enough that that would cause him to leave. So there's another explanation, which is, of course, that people leave for opportunities. And that also complicates this conversation. And just to say that, you know, for most of my working life, what I've been working with is how the Bangladeshi narrative of the past constantly changes and how secularism and religion gets reinserted, moved to the top, moved down. Um, and one of the places is in the careers of people like Zonul Abedin in painting, and then um, somebody else who hasn't been written about in English, Monzur Alom Beg, who is given the title of Alok Chitra Charjo, which means Dean of Photography. He's also someone whose career spanned uh, the Pakistan and Bangladesh period, but in all the biographies or writings about him, it's as if Pakistan never existed. He was a photographer for the Pakistan Air Force. He's a very... You know, I, I'm trying to figure out why these things are so uncomfortable to enter into the national narrative. And for the Bangladeshi national narrative, the position of religion within that it sits very large. And one part of the narrative was that a large part of the population had moved on beyond religion. And that narrative moves to the front during the external presentation of the 1971 war, especially to the Indian public. So if you look at a lot of the secular framing of the Bangladesh Liberation War, a lot of it comes after May and June when there's a desire to appeal to the Indian public and to the Indira Gandhi government in a form that's seen as non-threatening. But very soon in 1972, you see that that secular formation isn't so widely accepted. Um, I and mean, that's a very long, complicated history, but I think that's always in there and how these people are remembered. So Zainul Abedin, his entire pre-1947 career kind of disappears. And then at certain points, you have other kinds of Zainul biographies that jump from 47 to 71, skipping East Pakistan or talking about East Pakistan as if he's, um, you know, he has done it for Bangladesh. Um, I even noticed with those architects that I mentioned, American architects, um, every institution that they built is called Bangladesh Institute of et cetera, et cetera, even though those were done in the Pakistan period. So even in the retelling of something as I don't want to say straightforward, but as written down as a name of a building when it was founded, now those buildings all have to be rewritten as the Bangladesh National Museum, even though there was no Bangladesh in, let's say, 1964. So not a direct answer to your question, but just some of the things I've been thinking about. Could I say something in defense of Marx? I wanted to respond to what you said. And uh, also because this was part of your question. You know, if you think of just that passage, uh, Opium of the People, I think mostly Marxists generally, everywhere, particularly Indian Marxists, I think they have, um, you know, they have shrunk uh, what you have got in that passage. You know, I personally feel that that passage is a summary. It's such an astounding summary in three, four sentences, you know, of uh, Feuerbach's book, Essence of Christianity, which has two parts. The first part is the theological untruth of religion, right? That is the opium of the people. And the second part is the anthropological truth of religion, you know, which is actually the, the soul of a soulless world. So if we take both these, you know, then I think it becomes possible for the leftists to completely reorientate, you know, our relationship towards our attitude towards religion. It can remain critical. You know, we need not cease to be critical, but the nature of the criticism can be transformed. Did you want to say something? Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, oh, you can see that I'm good. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's making sense. No, I mean, this is just going back to the this kind of spiritual question. I mean, there's, it's not a coincidence that Tapati, when she brought up the spiritual, also brought up Orientalism. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's kind of the problem with spirituality. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just a kind of secularish supplement to religion. It's also, it comes with the baggage of opposition to the material, which we might say the anthropological kind of uh, you know, the recognition of the anthropological truth of religion. So, and that's the trouble with the spiritual, mm -hmm. is it's deployed in these situations where you're, try you're grasping for 
that anthropological truth to, to somehow be able to address it, or you're trying to reinvent religion in the modality of a kind of, well, I mean, we know that religion as a concept is modeled on a certain Protestant understanding of what we call religious practice. So dematerialized, faith, right? hinging on the word. So theology becomes super important for religious studies until very recently when suddenly they discover material religion, visual religion, and so on. So, you know, so, so spirit, the spiritual, Absolutely. I think, always has, has this yeah. cloud hanging over it. It's very important, but it's trying to do something sure. that we don't really have the language for. You know, I'm glad you brought it up because I think we've been talking about chronotopes, times and contexts in which terms and ideas and vocabularies take on a particular dispensation. And the spiritual is precisely that which troubled me deeply when I was working on art and nationalism to understand the ways in which an entire generation of scholarship which commanded authority within the field, used the spiritual as a way of, as Kajri said, of you know, contesting the Eurocentric. And on the other hand, we know that um, entire history of modernism has cultivated the spiritual in a, in a different sense, etc. So I'm glad that Kajri has brought it back that to me, it comes as a baggage of Orientalist and nationalist discourse, and it covers a gam gamut of thinking of a period which I would really locate in the 19th and early 20th century, and leads to specific forms um, that could range from the theosophical to the Ramakrishna mission movement to Brahmoism, and a series of very kind of in forms of engagement that are very located in the modern, right? So, but what, what would we do with the spiritual today? What would we think of the devotional today? Because the spiritual the was- The spiritual enters Gita Kapoor. Of course. <coughs> and so, so yeah. I, I, I want to uh, ask you like how you would then think of, yeah. given this trajectory of the spiritual enters Gita Kapoor to do a certain kind of work, that's something you were talking mm. earlier about, what do images do, like what is spiritual doing mm. in her writing? Mm. Um, and so in a similar way, that, that was a parallel with secular, we make it do certain kinds of work for us Absolutely. in a fraught, contested context. So she's, is she repurposing, retooling spiritual out of its orientalist, nationalist, mm. Um, to do something else, to become more capacious in a moment when nationalism is, being, is, is closing its boundaries, so the hard and the soft, anyways. This is just to speak, I think, to devotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what Tapati said, yeah. was, you know, that seems to be at the crux of it. Yeah. Because, you know, people like Ghulam Sheikh, Hupen, Kakar, they're, they're going back to the Bhakti tradition which is a huge sort of wellspring of some kind of secular avant la lettre, right? So I think it is, to, in my reading, I would say it's the spiritual is a kind of, it, it speaks to devotion, mm -hmm. devotionalism of the bhakti type, which has a social, social justice agenda mm -hmm. attached to it. Um, how would you come... So many of the authors in the volume are yearning for something more from academic writing and investigation, which I don't want to name it as a yearning for, for the spiritual, except <laughs> I think there is a, that or, or a, an acknowledgement that that sits within so much of what we do but aren't allowed to talk about it or that the disciplines don't provide the space for that. Um, how do you contend with that, this... I mean, the spiritual is enchantment, also a spirituality, a type of spirituality. This and that word comes up in so many essays. Um, the desire to bring back enchantment, 
um, or, to, or to allow oneself to feel enchantment. What do you think of that? I want to um, think about the observation that uh, Shudiptada made about Tagore, science, and uh, if he could think his sense of the existence of God at some level, right? In his case, maybe a formless God. Uh, you know, that is one way, that is one kind of gamut where the aesthetic, the spiritual, the deeply sensible, you know, his and sensorial, and a belief in scientificity and a belief in spirituality can coexist without any of the contradictions and tensions. But I want to say that how do we deal with it? And this is where we end up with a hard political ideology and the way science and an entire engineering and technological profession, while remaining in the profession, have use the religious. So I'm just thinking of a very crude example. The Chandrayaan mission was overtly being celebrated through yagyas, temple kind of rituals. Now, we may or may not see this as oppositional. We may see this as part of a public political a belief in science, that it was believed that there were all these actual religious rituals being performed in temples across that were going to ensure the success of a scientific mission. Now, there's one way in which we can expose this to political ridicule, which we do. But it's also the fact that, on one hand, it is the world of science, engineering, and high technology, which also represents one kind of vision of uh, I will not use the word hard, but a kind of Hindu political right now, right? They, as Kajri said, there are many, many agents and actors here, and they are some of the most powerful agents and actors here. And there's a popular domain of faith and belief. <laughs> now, we are comfortable with Tagore and Tagore's entire range of concern from the formlessness of the godly and the divine to his ultimate faith in, in science of some kind. What is more troubling are these other realities for which we are then continuously grappling with, you know, is this the way to celebrate secular science? What is happening, right? So what are priests and various astrologers doing in this? And that is precisely the reality and the mix that we've been contending with, and not just now, for many more. And I'm not saying that hard and soft, that Tagore's is not a soft position at all. Yes. It is a far more intellectually thought through position. Yes. That today we can see different spectrums of it. But I'm therefore thinking that, you know, one easy way of saying we need to recover the secular against an increasingly majoritarian kind of across nations, majoritarian religious dispensations. But the real problem is that, say, we left that ideology aside, um, which it's not easy to, but say, if it, say that majoritarian political kind of regime was to go away, which we all wish for in each of our different national contexts the secular would still be threatened and in crisis and in need for various kinds of intellectual and affective you know, modes of reclaim. So I, what I wanted to put to you was to really think about Tagore, science, and his spirituality, his sense of belief, with this other spectrum. And how do we then deal with it? And I'm sure you, Kaji, will have lots to say on this. That, in a way, this, this has been dismissive, and yet, how do we reclaim it? And that's a lot of, you know, this, the popular image worlds, popular faiths are there. Can I propose that we take the conversation 
outside? Uh, to the reception outside. And as a way to have like smaller conversations, I think some people didn't ask questions, but I thought might want to do it in like uh, smaller uh, settings. But thank you very much. Thank you so much.